to episode 60 of the Coffee at 11 show on this windy and grey morning here in Ireland. I'm delighted to have you here. Thank you for being here. In particular, I want to thank Paddy O'Connor, a friend of mine, a guy I've known for several years, a guy who I admired for several years. I'd like to welcome you, Paddy, to the Coffee at 11 show, brought to you courtesy of wigwam.ie SME peer support. Paddy O'Connor, come in and say hello and show us your coffee mug, please. Hi, everybody. Pleasure being here. And Paddy, indeed, it's our pleasure. So let me just tell you a little bit about the man himself um, before I bring him in to, uh, to tell us the story. Fascinating story that it is. So obviously, Paddy O'Connor is his name. Business name, Cara Projects. Now, we're going to be talking about Cara Projects, but that's not P Paddy's business per, per se. This is a, a charity operation that Paddy set up several years ago. And what does Cara Projects do? A charity in Kenya, he says, we have a girls rescue center outside Nairobi where we took up, where we look after up to 35 girls at a time in the center. To date, we have 350 little girls on our books, with 44 of them going to boarding schools. We also try and place our girls back with a family member, if at all possible, and sometimes where the child might be living with a poverty-stricken grandparent, we find it is cheaper and easier to send this girl to boarding school, where at least they will be educated, but also fed and boarded. How long established the centre is built and open approximately eight years, though I've been working in Kenya for 15 years. Really looking forward to hearing that story. And how many employees? 12 in Kenya at our centre at Kenyan wage rates and two in Ireland on a volunteer basis. And if I'm not mistaken, that's yourself and the lovely Roshi Kelly, who's also here in the cafe today. You're very welcome, Roshi. Um, so he's a self-employed, Paddy's a self-employed welder engineer since 1997, married to Magella for the last 32 years and have two daughters, Sarah and Alex. Two years ago, Sarah gave us our first grandchild. Congratulations. A beautiful little girl called Gracie, who is the light of my life. Apparently that often happens. And I truly love being a grandfather and feel so blessed. In my spare time, do you have any spare time? <laughs> he says, in my spare time, I run along with my great friend, Roisin Kelly, an Irish registered charity, charity uh, called Cara Projects. We run a girls' rescue centre just outside the city of Nairobi, and of course, we've covered that. And uh, here's an interesting thing. Somebody, nobody knows about Paddy. I'm an avid supporter of Stoke City Football Club. And have you met the other avid supporter, Paddy? Right, <laughs> Paddy O'Connor. Paddy O'Connor. I'm getting, I'm getting the finger wag from the princess. <laughs> right, Paddy O'Connor. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Thank you for taking the time out. So, over to you. Will you go right back? Bring us back to those early years as a nipper in Kildare and all the way up. And what got you into, what got you, got you interested in the work that's going on in Kenya? Please. Um, I had, I had been on the board of management of my daughter's primary school for oh maybe 10 years and the headmaster um Jerry Odunu had gone out to uh, Kilimanjaro on one of these sponsored climbs and part of that he was taken to an orphanage just outside Nairobi because Kilimanjaro spans Kenya and Tanzania and um came home very much affected gathered a, a gang of guys together to go out and work in with this orphanage but through an Irish charity based in Dublin. Um, now, to be fair to this charity, they'd never done any building before, so it was new to them. But, oh my God, we wasted tens of thousands of euro out there. Um, Four-wheel drive jeeps pulling up and, you know, and I came home a bit disillusioned, really, if, if the truth is known. And But at the same time, felt that, you know, I'm a welder, and most tradesmen can take a, touch the hand at a bit of carpentry, a bit of building. So I kind of knew the building game anyway, and I just thought I could do this. Um, and a guy at the time called um, Niall Mellon, uh, building the houses of Africa, was on the go. So I, I kind of bought into the way he did it, Vol raising, getting volunteers to raise a certain amount of money, taking them out, and using that money to build. So. I gathered nine guys together and I went out and I built a small extension on a school down in Mombasa, which is the base, the tourist area of, of Kenya. And then went out the following year and built a nine classroom school out there. Now, when I say a nine classroom school, it was a timber structure with steel sheeting, a very nice building, but by, by Kenyan standards, but a pretty simple build. The government took it over and kind of that's where it went on from. But I still felt that I wanted to get involved in, with the children's side of things and possibly girls because it, coming from a house full of girls, I suppose, um, 
I would probably have been drawn that direction. So I ended up going over to Kenya um, one for a week just to kind of suss out where I was going with all of this. And I met the lady um, of the first orphanage I'd gone over, the one I was a bit disillusioned about. Mary was her name. And she took me down into the slums of Kibera. Now, Kibera is probably the, is the biggest slum in Africa and probably the world. There's, there's nearly 2 million people living in a, a place the size of, I don't know, Askeaton. You know, a really small little place, nearly 2 million people in, oh my God, filth and dirt and open sores and really mind-boggling that people could live in, in, in these types of situations. And she introduced me to a lady called Mama Tunza. Mama Tunza was running an orphanage there with about 80 children in it. And she took me in to meet this lady and it was just dreadful. There was 47 little boys living in a, a 10 by 10 room, sleeping in fertilizer bags. It, it, it really upset me actually. And I, I, I came home that evening actually, it was a Monday, I came home that evening and I was, I was heartbroken really. I didn't know what I could do. I was in any position to do anything. That was Monday, I arrived home Tuesday morning. Wednesday evening, I was in the bath and Magella shouts up the stairs to me that, that there's a, a program on the telly about Kenya, a program called Dispatches, Channel 4 run it. So of course I rushed down the stairs and sure enough, they were in, in Nairobi and next minute they, they came into to Kibera. And I said to Magella, that's where I was two days ago. And I declared to God the next minute, Mama Tunza came onto the telly and her orphanage and I can feel the hair standing back of my neck now. I just thought, my God, the other side of the world, and, and I'm back here in my own house two days, and there she is. It was just meant to be, I presume. So that really set me in motion and thinking. And I gathered 37 local tradesmen here together. And through a friend of a friend, I got in touch with um, a New Zealand charity called GVN, Global Volunteer Network. And they had a piece of land just outside Nairobi that they wanted to do something with. And I asked them, could I build an orphanage for these people? So I gathered these Irish tradesmen and we all went over. And in 11 days, we built this 6,000 square foot massive concrete orphanage for these children to take them out of Kibera. Bula bus there, buddy. Let me just come in here. Bula bus. Yeah, just it, be, it was finished, just, but like just, it had to be painted just, and that, you know. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Hang on a sec. Yeah. Slow down. We've got to catch up with you. Is that okay? Yeah. It's, it's, it's a wonderful journey, uh, but I, I want to make sure that everybody gets nuances in it, if you, if you don't mind. So uh, I, I tell you what I think is fascinating. I think the universe wanted you to do the work you're doing in Kenya, and that was uh, manifested itself because you're back home only two days later in the bath, and Magella's shouting up the, the, the stairs, and when you come down, Mama Tons is on the television. Those type of coincidences, you know, in my world is the universe uh, speaking to you and you, you listened. And I think the hairs went up on the back of all of our necks when you were talking about it just now. So congratulations to you for listening and then taking action. Um, before we go to the wonderful work that you're doing uh, over there, yourself and Roisin and all the wonderful people that you've attracted around you, would you oblige and bring us back? Because I'm curious, you, you touched on it earlier. You touched on the fact that you were specifically interested in young girls because of all your sisters. Would you mind taking us back to those early years in Kildare, you know, where, where do you hail from? You're, you're a welder, steel man profession. How did that all come about? And then we, we go back to Kenya. Yeah. Well, my dad met my mum in England. Um, my mum was a, was, a, was a Protestant, an English Protestant. My dad was a Catholic, um, a mixed marriage. Um, when they married, I was the first born. Um, we had five, I had two brothers and two sisters. And the um, understanding was that we all had to be brought up as Catholics. Though my dad never took us to church. My mum took us to the Catholic church every Sunday. Um, and we all moved back to Ireland here in 67. So I was probably, I was six years old nearly then. Um, and I've lived in Ireland ever since. Um, and came up in a beautiful childhood. My dad, um, God, God, God rest him, he hadn't got hands to scratch his backside, we, we say here. He wasn't a tradesman, but he always wanted us to, to be tradesmen. College wasn't a thing then. You didn't go to university. You went on and you always... So my brother's an electrician. I, I'm a fitter or a welder. And he, he, he always said, don't be a craftsman, be a master craftsman. And uh, <laughs> I often found that funny because my dad couldn't swing a hammer. <laughs> but um, but we had a great childhood. And he always instilled in that thing. My dad had great pride in us. And 
always instilled that if you can look in the mirror in the morning, you know, without hating yourself and can shave yourself without wanting to cut yourself, you're not doing too badly. And he always said also about like sin, you know, he said, Sonny said, if you know it's wrong, then it's wrong. If your conscience tells you that that's wrong, it's wrong. And that's what I would consider sin. And he'd often say to me, you know, sometimes it's more important to be a good Christian than a good Catholic. You know, if you do what's right in life. And I've tried to install that in my two girls as well, thank God. And like Sarah's 31 now and Alex is 26. And Alex wants to fight for the world. and <laughs> we, we bounce off each other. But um, no, I, I, I think my children, I take more pride of anything from my children because they're, they're great, you know. Paddy, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that because what it does is it brings context to who the man is sitting in front of us. So really, thank, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I, I was making notes there. I was smiling away. My own dad, Tommy O'Brien, has joined us in the cafe today because you're here. And dad, you're very welcome. Lovely to have you in the cafe. And I was smiling when you said uh, your dad hadn't got hands to scratch his backside, right? Which th I think, by the way, was you being polite, right? <laughs> but he hadn't got hands to scratch his backside. Uh, and he couldn't swing, swing a hammer. And I'm thinking of my own poor dad there because he, he has those wonderful hands. He can turn his hand to anything. And I'm the guy who hasn't got hands to scratch his backside, right? So I don't know how he's feeling about that. Anyway, um, also, I love the fact that you uh, spoke about your Protestant mom and a, and a Catholic dad and referred to that as a mixed marriage, which is a really interesting take on perhaps what others might consider a mixed marriage. Uh, but of course, that's, that's the reality of the Christian world in particular. Ireland, England, and all the stuff that goes on there uh, between our two nations and our two uh, our two religions, both uh, Christian. Um, interesting stuff. And then that your dad never took you to mass, but your your mother, your mother, happily took you off down to mass every 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 week. Um, for me, it's formative. That, that's why I wanted to go there. And thanks for bringing us there, Paddy. It's formative. And uh, you know, if you can stand and look yourself in the mirror and shave yourself and not cut yourself, not want to cut yourself, it's good. Uh, if you know it's wrong, it's wrong. Beautiful advice from your dad. So, great, we now know the, 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 the foundation, okay? And the Princess Shelley there giving the Buddha bus, thank you for that, Princess Shelley. Right, then you became, you got into the steel game, right? Clearly handy with your hands. Um, how did you get into the steel game? And we, we're going back to Kenya now in a few minutes, but how did you get into the steel game? Well, in 1979, I, I, I got a first year off the job thing. It was a training in Anko at the time. It became FOSS. So I did my first year in Anko um, as a fitter. Now, I didn't even know what a fitter was. Uh, and a fitter can be welding, can be steel farming, can be maintenance of engines. So a fitter, a fitter is a really, really kind of a... You could be 50 years a fitter and not touch on all of it. It's kind of welding is the way I went. Um, served my apprenticeship for the four years, um, joined the army, in, in because I live here on the Curragh. Um, my dad didn't want me in the army. My dad was in the army and he said, I don't want you in the army, but he helped me to get in and he was right. I lasted 18 months in the army and passed out as best soldier, loved the army side of things, but put me into the engineers and I did nothing all day long. I nearly cracked up. So I bought myself out of the army after 18 months and went into the welding job then fully. Um, but the welding game, it's a, it's a tough game. It can be like I was working on the ships, I was working in the quarries, and it's a hard game that you can only do for so long. So in 97, I, I decided I was doing what we call nixers up here in Kildare, jobs on the side at night. And a fellow once said to me, when, you, when the nixers get in the way of the job, or the job gets in the way of the Nixers, that's maybe the time to jump. And and I did, and I was terrified of it. And I, and I said to this guy, you know, I, I really don't know if I can do this. And he said, what are you scared of? And I said, I'm scared of starving. And he said, well, nobody in Ireland starves. And he's right, because we have a wonderful system here. And I got help then with the um, the social welfare, helped me for the first five years. They gave me a certain amount of, of money to keep me going. And it went on from there. And the last company I had worked for had been building machinery, um, automation, conveyors, and that type of thing. And I, I happened to get working down in Wyatt's in a skeet in the baby food factory that they make SMA baby food. So that really helped because the company I worked for, they were from England, they went bust, they went out of business. But at that stage, I had been in Wyatt's servicing the machines. And I, I have to say, they were a wonderful company. I went down to see them and 
I asked him, I was 20, I don't know who I was, I was 20 something anyway, and I said, look, I'd, I'm thinking of going out on my own. This would be a help if you could give me the trade. And they did, and they helped me to get my insurance because I was totally green. I knew nothing about this. And I'm still with them today, though it's lessening now. Um, so that's really where I am. Um, I've been self-employed since 97. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for that. And, uh, you know, the measure of the man sitting in front of me that Wyatt still uh, have you working with them all these years later and that they willingly stepped up and helped you get, get set up. I love that phrase that your friend said, nobody will starve in Ireland. You'd be grand. You know, uh, yeah. huge fear out there. I had a huge fear out there for people who are in, you know, getting a paycheck, uh, you know, uh, but bristling with, with uh, wanting to get out and, you know, test their metal, if you like. And uh, I also love the fact, and you know, I, I honour you for this. You joined the army, you joined the engineers, thinking it would be, you know, manna from heaven, and you just did nothing. And you said, hang on a second, there's more to life. You, you need to be busy. You, you're an absolute, the definition of a, a contributor. Uh, you're the definition of a contributor, and you're putting your skills to wonderful use. Okay, we went over to Nairobi. You brought us there at the very start. Um, you painted... A, a very important picture around the whole NGO space, which is money being wasted on stuff. And you, you, you used four wheel drives as, as an example of that. I'm involved in a charity myself and every euro that's spent on stuff that's not frontline is one less recipient of that services, that charity services being looked after. So I'm with you on that. So again, hats off to you, and you said, okay, you're seeing all this waste, you can do better, perhaps. And did you tell us that you got 37 people around you for that first trip? Okay, so we're back to you and 37 others building the first, the first orphanage. Tell us what happened next, please. Well, we all went out, these 37 guys, and the, lit, the little bit that I knew about Kenya was 100 times more than they knew about Kenya. And of course, we arrived out there, with, we're going to do this, and... Everything is different in Africa. Um, here, we, I would say that raw materials are cheap and labor is expensive. But in Africa, it's the exact opposite. The raw materials are expensive, but the, the, but the labor is quite cheap. So I, I, I hired um, a lot of Kenyan guys with us. And Kenyan tradesmen, they call them fundies, are extraordinarily talented people. But in a more basic comp thing than we are you know they'll spend the day twisting wire while we buy it in because it's cheaper than the labor so and i always firmly and i still to this day believe that and roshi will laugh when, when i say this because i keep saying it i firmly believe that when we're in the area we hire local we buy local we have our lunch local Typical Irish man, we go for a pint and we go local. So that everybody in the area gets a slice of the cake. And you build up a trust among them because trust is a big thing. Irish people trust easily, but other nationalities don't. In fact, it's our culture to trust. Um, so we got this place built with all kinds of struggles, no cranes, no teleporters, everything done by hand. Um, and the guys were fabulous. I mean, Irish tradesmen were at, at, are top class. And these guys were really top and knew what they were doing at far. And in 11 days, as I said, we put in toilets. We put 100 beds in. We, this place was a fabulous place. Now, it needed to be painted, obviously. It needed the footpaths put in after we left, the gardening, all that type of thing. But the basic structure was there. We came home from Ireland. And I had it in my mind that maybe next year I'd go and try to build another orphanage. But unfortunately, I got dragged, not unfortunately, that's probably the wrong word. I got dragged into the running of Tunza's children's home, which we'd built. Um, and that's where it got really hard because I was getting phone calls in the middle of the night because they never quite embraced that they're three hours ahead of us. So they'd be calling me at, it's five o'clock over there. It's two o'clock in the morning here. I just stopped bringing my phone to bed because I was getting woken up and, I slowly but surely got dragged into the running of it, um, paying education fees, trying to pay for um, feed, food, all of this type of thing. And as I said to Sarah earlier, this and it sounds really bad, there's money in poverty. You know, there's, and there's money in religion in some parts of Africa as well. It's where you gather people, they all give their dues, and sometimes they're not doing it for the right reasons. Though Mama Tunza was, but of course she was illiterate, 
uneducated and I'm not, I'm not particularly well educated, but so she was listening to different people. There was always somebody behind getting a copper back and, and I got to a stage where I'd say to her, Mama, how can you seriously listen to these people? And I'm here trying to supply and you won't listen to me. And I just got tired. I, I got totally and utterly emotionally, everything more now. If I didn't have a breakdown, I'll never have one after that. It just got to a stage. I loved the kids, but I wasn't getting anywhere. It was killing me. It really was killing me. And um, if I'm going to take five euros off Princess Shelley, I need to know where that five euros is going. You know, I don't need to know where every single the shillings in Kenya is going, but I need to know where 95% of it is because... I'm raising it on, on, on my name and on your name. And so I had to make sure that, and it wasn't happening. I knew there was money going amiss. And in the end, I just got so tired and weary that I didn't know what to do. And I went to the local chief, stop me if I'm going on too long, but I went to the local chief and, and um, I said to him, look, at, is there a lady here that might have left college last year who's into the children that could administer this place and help me? to get this place running properly. And he introduced me to a young lady called Edwina Kuala. My God, what a lady this girl was. She was about 19 years old, had a young son. Her husband was in university. Um, her dad had been a children's officer in the town of Ngong where we were. So she grew up with probably 20 kids in her house every night. So she, she had the passion. I brought her into, in, into Mama Tunza's and within four months, the place was just ticking. It was just starting to work. But what I didn't realize was they thought Tunza's that the children's office had sent her in and the chief had sent her in. So they respected her for that. They were quite scared of her. But after about eight months, they got wind that it was actually me that had gone looking for her. And God, uh, what's the word? And then the fertilizer hit the fan. <laughs> um, it went, they went ballistic. Uh, they threw her out. They, they didn't want anything to do with her. I ended up going back to Nairobi, sitting with them. And in the end, they said that they would, they would leave, they would keep her. But I knew once I went back to Ireland, she'd be walking home some night and she'd be found dead. You know, I just knew that that's how much money was kind of involved. And I said to Edwina, look, it's over. Let, let, let's, let's forget about it. I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm worn out. Of course, I still love, and I'm, we're still in contact with all of these young kids who are in that orphanage. Um, in the meantime, I came home, and I used to go into the Fuji shop in Newbridge to get my photographs um, printed out. And, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bit technical. I'm, I'm, I'm useless. I can do an old engine, but don't ask me to get photos out of a, out of a phone. So a beautiful lady in that shop called Roisin Kelly used to come and help me to do, pick out the photographs. And she used to look at it and she'd say, I'd love to go to Kenya. And I said, well, why don't you? And she said, you know, maybe I will. And herself and her gorgeous daughter, Neve, the following year, I was going out to build another orphanage, came out with me. And that's where the partnership of uh, Paddy and Roisin came on board. Um, she came out. God, Roisin will tell you, we had a terrible year. Um, we had planned to build this orphanage. Just, just before we go there, yeah. per perfect segue, perfect segue. Roisin, you're very welcome to the cafe. We see you're here and uh, there's a bus going on all over the place for you. Uh, if you'd like to come in and have a chat with us later, you might stick on your video. That would be lovely. People, I'd love people to meet you. Uh, but Paddy, I, I, it's, it's great that you brought us to the point where you met Roisin because I was, that was going to be my next question. How did that come about? and simply happened in the Fuji shop in Newbridge, which is just brilliant. Um, so if I understand it correctly, and that was, that was some journey you took us through, right? And, and the fact that you actually said there's money in poverty and there's money in religion in certain parts, it's a bit scary. And you went on to say that lovely Edwina Koala, um, you know, th there was a serious risk to her life because of what she was doing. That's just incredible. I don't think that we can really comprehend that stuff here. Even the fact that, you know, Paddy O'Connor from Newbridge County Kildare, Steelman, had to go and see the local chief. You know, it's wild thinking, for, certainly for me, perhaps for a lot of people in the cafe. You uh, had to go and see the local chief and you identify this, this lady. But all of it comes back to you and who you are as a man, right? And, and your sensibilities, which is why I asked you to take, take us back into your early years, because that forms the picture as to why you're so empathetic to the plight of these people. 
and they're an extremely hard worker, a contributor, as I've said, and you, you helped establish that first, uh, that first orphanage. If I'm not mistaken, we're about to go to the second orphanage because you had to step away from that first one. Is that correct? Mm. So take it from there, please. Thanks, Paddy. So at, at this stage, um, my plan had been that I'd build a different orphanage kind of every year. I would never get involved in running an orphanage. What would I know about running an orphanage? And um, so I went out, I was going out with another, I think we had 42 guys together. At this stage, I was kind of getting known. I was bringing adults out. And that's how Roisin and Neve came on board, Neve, Neve being Roisin's daughter. We came out and I'll never forget it. I, it was in June, but in the previous November, I'd gone out to get the foundations put in because the building had to start. We hadn't time to put in foundations. We'd literally start laying blocks. And at that stage, and as I said earlier, the Kenyan shilling is, is, is the rate. And it's normally like, like, like um, a cent here. You'd have a hundred cent to a euro. It's normally a hundred shillings-ish to a euro. But at that stage, it was 121 shillings to a euro. So we're getting good money at the time. So I could, I could manage to um, get everything bought. And when I went out in June, the rate had fallen to 92 shillings to a euro. And my world fell apart because we lost 25% of our budget. So when I was there, Roshin was with us. It was the worst of times. I was in a terrible state. I, I, I came home owing nearly 20,000 euros from my own pocket. And like, I was only kind of, you know, living from, well, no, I won't say living from hand to mouth, but you know, a normal working person. My wife works in a solicitor's and I said, Magella, I think I could have bankrupt us, you know, we're, I mean, but I built up such a good repertoire at that stage in Kenya that all the, the building shops had given me credit and you can't get credit in Kenya, you know, it, and, and I built up, thank God, enough that I came home. I owed 20,000, but I owed it to the poor Kenyans. I didn't actually, but I had to find it. And Roisin said that time, it was so bad that she said, she cried one night over there in the hotel we used to stay saying, why did I ever come to Kenya? And I don't blame her. <laughs> She's as mad as me because how she stuck at it, I don't know. We came back and we talked and we got it. We got we, 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 we found a lady for this orphanage to put her into it, through the chief again. This woman was perfect, we were told. We put this lady in, and after four months, I knew she was a crook. I knew we had made an awful mistake. But we owned this land, not like the first piece. We had been given it by a... We actually had bought this piece of land. So it took us about six months to get this lady out then, possession being nine pints of the law in a different country. The chief, thank God, helped us to get it out. So finally, we were, we had our building back, but what do we do with it? You know, what do I know? I have a building now in Kenya, sitting on a piece of land. I've made an awful mistake, you know. So Edwina Kuala came back into my head, the same lady, and I called to her and I said, Edwina, can you come and meet me and sit and talk? What can we do here? And she came back and she brought six young girls, again from university, with her to just talk and Please, I'm not a chauvinist by any means, but I'm a man and, and I'm no good at that type of thing. I, I, you know, a woman brings a softness to it. They're, 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 they're not commodities, they're children. And, you know, she, she felt that the girl child in Kenya needed to be looked after, that we wouldn't open an orphanage, we'd open a rescue center. In other words, where the children would come into us, they might be with us for three days, the could be with us for three weeks, the could be with us, we've had some for three years, but that we try and get them back out then to the community, back in with a family member if we could, if we could um, subsidize that person. So that was a brilliant idea. And I went back to Ireland here, sat with Roisin, and we decided then that maybe we should set up a charity. That would give us, a, at this stage I wasn't registered, that would give us a bit of credibility. It would mean that we'd have to be audited we might get some grants, though we've never, ever received a grant. Um, and I asked Roisin became a board member then because we had to set up a business, which is tons of limited as it happens, trading as car projects. And thank God Roisin has been there with me since the, that day as a, as a board member. Well done, Bula Boss. Mm. Bula Boss. Let me just again come in here because there's mm. so much going on here. 
so much going on here. Congratulations to you and Roisin uh, for sticking with it. Um, I, I smiled because I, uh, you were talking about own 20 grand. First of all, congrats on, on getting such a great reputation that the Kenyans would trust you with their money and they'd know they'd get looked after. But again, it's the measure of the man. It, it, it oozes out of you. Um, but you said there that poor Al Roisin was in the hotel over there and she was crying. I was thinking she's crying because, because Paddy owes 20 grand. She's crying because, why did you ever come to Kenya? <laughs> That's fabulous. Um, the unfortunate journey in some senses that you've had, you know, you put a lady into uh, your, your second orphanage and within a few months you realize she's a crook and then she goes through the process of getting her out. Like, you know, lesser men would have thrown in the towel, for sure. You know, there's, there's more to life, but you keep going. Uh, Edwina, bringing Edwina back and she brings six girls and you're having the chat and, you know, you mentioned your a man and Edwina brings a softness to it and it was Edwina's understanding of what was going on on the ground there that said it's got to be a rescue centre. It's just, it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous that that's the way it unfolded because that's what the universe needed, that's what that your, your facility over there was needed for. That's why you've been through the journey, that's why you met Edwina and lost sight of her and went back to her. So it's, it's absolutely fantastic but it couldn't have happened without you and Roisin stepping up and forming CARA projects as a charity. I love the fact that it's tons of limited. Intrigued by that choice of name, uh, given given the history. The Your problem with the Cara bit was Cara matches, you had Cara, so many different names that, 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 the, um, that the business people wouldn't accept the name. And I thought, well, there's nobody going to have Tunza in Ireland, so <laughs> we go with Tunza Limited, and that, that, that's how we ended up with Tunza. That's for sure. That is for sure. Okay, so once you got on track, Edwina, you're in your second place. Yourself and Roshi and Cara Project is up and running. Has it been all plain sailing since, Paddy? <laughs> There's nothing about Africa, plain sailing. Um, well, what happened then was the almighty crash came in 2009 here in Ireland. And that wiped me because what builder was going to come with me now? I mean, the builder depended on the hardware that he was buying stuff from to throw him a few quid, you know. So suddenly people couldn't raise, I think it was 2,000 euros to come out with me because our, our economy had crashed. So now we were in real trouble. We were, after getting this place up and running and suddenly we, were, we had a problem. And Roshi and I sat and we talked and we thought about this and at this stage, I had started going to schools, giving a talks to kids about what we did in Africa. And to see, to see a 15 and 16 year old looking up and, and, and listening to this, and the teachers used to laugh and say that when the bell went, there wasn't a charge out the door, which was, I must have been doing something right there. I must have been interested in them. So we said we'd start bringing out maybe a couple of transition year students with us on our trips. So the first year we had four came out. Then it went to 16. And last January and February, just gone, we'd 84 came out with us. So, um, yeah, we did two trips. We bought, in January, we bought the, the transition year. Obviously, we had to have adults with us as well. Excuse me. And February, we bought out the fifth years because there's, um, there's what you call it, a midterm break in February. So the week of the midterm break was one of the weeks they came to Kenya. They come for two weeks with us. So the fifth year didn't miss so much school. But in January, the transition year could, could handle that. So they're our backbone now. They're the people that are bringing us in the money because at this stage, the centre costs about, about 60,000 euros a year to run. Now, that doesn't sound a lot of money for 35 kids and we've 350 on our books, but you've still got to find it. You've still got to, you know, um, get that money. Like we've, four, we've 12 staff out there now. Just on that, uh, you know, the, you saw the rapturous um, silence the cafe you know you went from four uh, transition years to 84 that's a fun mm. increase and uh, love the fact by the way that the uh, the kids didn't stampede out the door once the bell went the teachers must hate that they must hate that to be honest right <laughs> <laughs> but but it, but it's because because you're so engaging and the story is so real and so powerful and of course they're they're thinking perhaps of their own little sisters you know and, and what, what for an accident of birth the ovarian lottery they were born in, in, in Ireland. Um, 60,000 euro a year, and you said earlier you don't get any government support. Wow, wow. How, so is it all fundraising, Paddy? No, what we do is 
these all of these children and adults that come with us they raise 2200 euros through tea parties through uh, rag days in school through uniform days and then out of that then myself and roshi we pay for the flights the meals the accommodation though we stay in the center now we used to stay in a hotel we have the the center in such as we can live there and um, their injections their malaria tablets and we've got to cut down that that costs about a thousand euros so that leaves us with 1200 euros from the 2200 now when we go there for the fortnight we have to do some kind of a project to keep these children these teenagers interested last year we put in biogas where we have we have pig projects in the center we use them we use the gas from the manure of the cow and the pig to cook in our kitchens so that we put a biogas system in last year i'm kind of bypassing myself a bit here i'll talk come back to it so we have to spend a certain amount on on two projects for the two weeks are there but if i'm left with sixty thousand coming home in in march i've enough for the year and that's where we are up to december of this year and i hope next year like we've 120 down for next year but you remember the great crash covid 19 oh so howdy <laughs> o'connor all that's happening here is the universe realizes you've got a broad back and you can handle it and handle it you're handling it uh, we, we we don't wish that you have to handle it in as tough as, as you have been to date but uh, you are handling it and you're 100 right uh, the crash happened and you thought you were knocked out and you weren't you got back up again and now COVID has happened and you know what's going to happen it'll come back around again somehow somehow you will smile sweetly on the great work that you're doing and it really is great work that you're doing. And I love the, the simplicity of your view of, the, of this, which is, because it's so contra to the, the four-wheel drive analogy that you painted for us earlier. It's yourself and Roshi and a handful of volunteers getting a whole load of kids together to go out and raise 2,200 euro. You've got your costs managed in such a way that there's 1,200 euro left. 1,200 euro divided into 60,000 is this number of people we need to be bringing with us right and it's it's really as simple as that and yet as difficult as that and COVID-19 is yet another challenge to overcome but you, you touched on the uh, on the the pig project right I noticed you're choosing your words very carefully here it was backside right it was fertilizer the fan right and we're now talking about uh, gases right but we know what you're talking about so t take us through some of those fascinating projects you also did a fish thing some years back fish farm Talk to uh, us. Colm, see my hands. I work on building sites all day. So I use a different language, a more colourful language when I'm on building sites. So I have to be really careful the way I say, the way I talk. <laughs> um, all of this stage that, that, that we were going through this, in the back of my mind, I'm saying, this is all wonderful. This is brilliant. But what happens if Paddy walks under a bus, sir? God forbid poor Roisin happens. Can Cara stand on its own? And it can't. So we, we had to look at this. It's wonderful for Paddy and Roisin. It might do their ego great that I'm running this and it's going to be great. But what happens if something happens to one of us? And this is where the fish projects, I knew we had to start getting projects going to become as self-sufficient as we could. We've only an acre and a half of land. What do we put onto this? So we started off with a pig, pig project. We started off with four we went up to 50 at one stage. Um, we started off with a fish project, buying fingerlings at this size for 15 shillings, 10 cent each, that after seven months are worth two euros each. So we'd have 2,000 of those. But the big problem then was, I built these wonderful big ponds. When the rains came then, they'd fill the pond, but I didn't allow for evaporation. What do I know of pigs? I didn't allow for, it didn't rain for 18 months. You know, all of these things seem to come there to beat you up and beat you back. And, and then another thing with, with Kenyans is a Kenyan lives from day to day. A Kenyan gets up in the morning and if they can feed their children, give them a breakfast. If they can look enough to educate them and send them to school. If they're lucky enough to get them back in the evening and give them some small light tea. That's, that's their day. And then tomorrow's another day. So to think six months down the line is a real challenge. And that's where we were, where we're kind of falling down. I'd say, if you can do this, next year we'll be here. No way. Tomorrow, 
That's as far as I'm looking. So you're fighting, and probably the biggest word I would say is culture. You're fighting culture. It's not religion. It's not color. It's not your um, your gender. It's culture. You know, you and me might say that early marriage in a young girl is wrong, and it is wrong. But the culture is what is what, and you're trying to fight culture all the time. We're dealing with the Maasai people because where we built is where the Maasai live. And they're a wonderful race of people, very, very dignified, very good people. But they practice FGM, which is female genital mutilation. They practice um, early marriage. We have a girl of 13 who's been married, as I said, twice to men of my age. You know, they practice the things. So I can think I'm a great guy, the big Umzungu, and Umzungu is a Swahili for a white man, can come in here and tell you, oh, this is wrong and you shouldn't be doing this. That's not, it doesn't work that way. You've got to, you've got to go at it in a softly, softly way to try and break down that culture. And thank God the Kenyan woman is starting to see this. We're getting women coming to our center with their daughters because they don't want the father to, to marry her off. Now, sometimes with, with um, I'm no good at big words, with, with chatting to them, what's the, I don't know the word I'm looking for, but we can get the mother and father together and talk this through. We can solve it sometimes. But me arriving at an early marriage as a white man and with the police behind me telling them to stop this, that's not going to work. So you've got to really go at it in the right way. And this is the, how wonderful Roisin is because she's much more in touch with that side of a woman that maybe I, I wouldn't be, um, you know. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it, Paddy. And again, you know, bull the bus for your, mm. your heart. Mm. Your heart in all of this. It's just gorgeous. Um, the, the big Unzungu, is that, what's, what's the phrase? And, and, and Unzungu is a white man, you know. Well, wow, incredible. Um, it, like, it, it beggars belief, it beggars belief, and it's a, it's a pleasure in a strange sort of way to hear the story at such depth. It's also disturbing in some way to hear the story at this depth. We are worlds apart from what you experienced over there, what they live. This living today, and then we get up and we go at it again tomorrow. You know, Western society is all about five-year plans and all the rest of it, right? Um, so I, I, I'm finding it hard to grasp. Um, and of course, any any charity like yours that's working over there, you see it for what it is on the ground. It really is fascinating and disturbing at the same time to hear the depth of the story. Uh, because all you know, when we're when we're asked to throw a few bob in a bucket, or we're asked to sponsor little Johnny because he's gone on a trip, it 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 we just don't get it. Is all I'm saying. We just don't get it. And I love your understanding that there's no point in you with the police arriving up uh, to uh, to a, a child marriage or to be taken on the world of uh, culture. You said uh, we're not fighting religion, we're not fighting color, we're not fighting all those things. We're fighting culture, and you've got to do that softly, softly. Um, I also think, by the way, I love the way that you honour Roisin in the partnership and, and that she's got a softness to her. But you know what? Uh, you have a softness that, uh, that belies, as you said yourself, the, the, the working man's hands. And, and you're getting the boot of us all around the cafe for that, for sure. Come here, an absolute pleasure having you here in the cafe to join us today, Paddy. Thank you. Can I share one story? Please. If I, it'd be two minutes, just to, because I've probably given a, a little bit of doom and gloom, and, and I don't want to because it's wonderful. There's far more pluses than there is negatives. We, I had a little girl called Priscilla in my first hour in tons of children's office. She came to us at 11 years of age. She was doing her leaving cert about four years ago. But it's not leaving cert. She was 17, and we had her in a boarding school, and... This is where Roshin comes in. She, she gets time to sit and talk to them. I'm trying to build something or put a bio guy. Roshin sits and talks. And her and Priscilla had a lovely, a lovely um, contact with each other. And she asked Priscilla, what was her story? How did she come to be in Tunzas? And she said, mum and dad, she calls us mum and dad. She said, I don't know if I'm an orphan or not. And, and I go, what do you mean you don't know? Well, she said, back in 2009, there was an election in, 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 in Kenya. And two parties came together, didn't believe that, that one had lost and one had won, and went at it. And the big thing in Kenya is your tribe. You can be a Kokuyu, you can be a Luob, you can be a Maasai. The, the tribe is everything. And they slaughtered each other. Overnight, they went mad at each other. 
It went on for nearly 15 months and little Priscilla was 11 and she was down in the local village with her mum and her brother and sister and it went off and she got separated. The mother fled one way and she happened to go the other way and she ended up in an IDP camp, an internally displaced persons camp, the plastic camp. Um, and so a lady ended up in Tunzas and was with us for six, six, nearly six years was with us, five and a half years, from 11 and a half up to 17. And that's where she was. She was in school. She didn't know anything. And Roisin said to me, Paddy, we have to do something. And I said, she said, what are we going to do? So we flew over, the two of us, one week in November. We took this little girl out of school. Now, Edwina at this stage was with us and her husband, Timothy. She wasn't happy about taking her out of school because she was doing her leaving cert this particular Saturday. We got into our van and we drove for four hours to a place called Lemuru. It's a place of tea plantation area. We got out of the van and, and Priscilla had a, a Roisin's hand and she pointed down this hill and said, that's where I used to live, but there was nothing there. And I went to the gates of, of this little tea plantation factory and in my pigeon Swahili asked this man, did he ever hear of this girl? And he hadn't. And I said, is there anybody six years or more in this factory that might have heard of her? And he said, no. And this is God is my judge. There was two little boys standing against the wall beside us, about six years of age and maybe eight. And one of them called me Umzungu Umze, which is an old white man. I was really browned off with that, I must admit. But <laughs> he said, we know this lady. And I said, what? She said, we know her. And I looked at Roshi and I thought, what have we got to lose? Let's follow these two kids. So they took us up this road and across this tea plantation. It was a beautiful area. And a little boy came running down towards us, about seven years of age, with a milk can. And we stopped, and he was Priscilla's brother. He'd been a year and a half when... We followed him anyway, up, up this route. And we came across a load of tin shacks. And I knocked on this tin door and I walked in and there was a woman inside with a fire inside, twigs with a blanket over where she they were sleeping and her three children. And I said, Gina Languni Paddy, my name is Paddy. Um, I have a girl here. And Priscilla burst past us and we found her mother. And I started to cry. Ro Roshi will tell you, we just sobbed. It was like somebody had released a pressure valve on the back of her neck. Because I was thinking, what am I doing here? What are we doing taking this child who hasn't found her parents in, her mother in five years in 49 million people to try and find her mother? I walked away and I went down to the local shop, Tin Shack, and bought some milk and tea and brought it back up. And we sat for an hour and her mother said to us, we had a name of a neighbour and his name was, say, Johnny. And I said, who was this man, Johnny? And she said his wife, she did, was a clairvoyant, basically. And his wife told her that if she prayed every day, a man would come to her door with her child. And after an hour, she let us take that child away and put her back into school. Can you imagine an Irish mother finding her child after five and a half years? And Priscilla's a nurse now. And she's the most wonderful little girl. She looks after the family. She's become the head of the family. But that's how much Roisin Kelly means to me. That's, she was that. Through the bus. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry, don't be sorry. Uh, I, I'll be honest and say I was a bit cruel there because I let you cry on camera because otherwise if I came in, I'd be crying. As I was, I see Princess Shelley dabbing the tears away. It's only the second time that's happened on the show. Roisin Kelly, you're a special woman. You're choosing to stay off camera, I think. You're welcome to pop in if you wish. And uh, which mean a lot to this man, that's for sure. <laughs> right. And Paddy O'Connor says to me, when I asked him would he come on the show, he said, I don't know what I've got to say. All you've got to do is tell the story, and you've done that. Right. We've, we've got, we, you, 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 you've, you've got a ton of uh, people here, and uh, more who hear and see this. Uh, Eamon has put the links into CAR project uh, websites and whatnot on the uh, and social media platforms in the chat. So feel free, please, to check. I just wanted to bring the last one in because just to show that it, we have an awful lot of positives. 
like we've we've had students that have excelled we've had um and I, and I should also say that we as a people irish people are wonderful there's nobody like us for 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 giving for for an open heart for um like to give their children to us to take to Africa and, and we respect those teenagers because we, we really truly involve them. You know, they paint murals for us and you'd be surprised how many kids come back and want to sponsor a child or something over in the center. So I, I have to say and that sometimes it's easy to run ourselves down, but as Irish people, I think we're a pretty exceptional race of people. We want to know everything about each other. We want to know how many kids you've got, you know, and, Somebody like your dad there, Colm. I just got taught him for a coffee one day and Tommy went off and held, it, held, held um, a, a cabaret show for me one night and raised 5,000 euros for us. It helped to pay for our minibus over there. People are wonderful, you know, and, and I never wanted to be seen as somebody, oh, he's looking for money. Oh, here's Paddy again, hide. But people are wonderful. Irish people are wonderful. Roisin Kelly has st stuck on her camera. I'm going to unmute you whether you like it or not. And you're coming in to say hello. Hi, everybody. Right. I'll have to be short and sweet, Colin, because I'm minding my mother here. That's why I was off video. Um, yeah, as Paddy said, I used to look at his photographs when he came into the shop and he had pictures of children in the dump with big vultures the size of the kids. The kids were picking, looking for plastic. And I was, and I said to him, I'd love to go. And I think he looked at me and said, oh, my God, you're too old for this caper. But he never said anything. <laughs> so I went and here I am still. And that day, Priscilla still sends the hairs on the back of my neck. It's, it's just the weirdest, wonderfulest day. Like, it was magic. Pure that magic. Pure. So sorry to make it all worthwhile. I, I'm delighted to hear you say that because it would appear there's a lot of ups and a huge amount of downs. And every, at every hand's turn, you seem to be getting tested and you keep coming through. So let's yeah. see what community let's put it out there and see can we garner support for you I, I don't quite know how but we put it out there and just yeah it's the, it's the COVID-19 thing that is the scary part because I don't know if we can bring people in January or February or it's going to be a big big challenge so we'll have to see how we go forward but miracles happen every day so let's, let's <gasps> I hope so <laughs> that's all for a miracle Roisin lovely to see you that's the cafe and everybody there Google thank you books. very much Lovely to have you here. Paddy, are you speechless? Do you want to say hello to your, your buddy there? I haven't, I haven't seen Groshin for a couple of weeks because that's another type of the person that she is. She goes down and looks after her mum in Ratvilly and leaves behind her grandchildren in Kildare here to look after her mum. And that's the type of person she is. And um, I'm looking forward to it. She's coming home on Tuesday. So we'll have a socially distant cup of coffee. <laughs> we will. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Roisin, thanks very much for popping in and congratulations. Keep up the great work. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Colin. Pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Right, um, I'm going to go to Princess Shelley because uh, it's, it's been a, it is a beautiful show. Uh, thank you, Paddy and Roisin, for all of, you, all of what you do. Paddy, thanks for coming in and telling the story so beautifully. Um, and I'm delighted, by the way, Paddy, that you, that you sort of called me out because, you know, I was moving on to the next phase and you, you, you had to tell us the Priscilla story. And that was the that, that, you know, the money shot. That's the one that we needed to hear. That's like pulled at all of our heartstrings. So thank you and well done. Congratulations, beautiful. Princess Shelley, over to you. Thank you. I needed that few minutes from Roisin just to pull myself together a small bit, actually. Um, Eamon has popped into the chat there and said that when you said, Paddy, what can we do here? You know, and like that, I love the simplicity of the question. I think that's what, what Eamon, why Eamon popped it in. And he said, um, that is such a powerful question, Paddy. It focuses the mind in every situation or challenge, even when things are good. And I just wanted to highlight it. So, um, so yeah, thank you for that, Eamon. I couldn't agree more. Um, Sandra, uh, who's joined us in the cafe. Hi again, Sandra. Lovely to have you here. Um, Sandra says, really inspiring. It's people like Paddy that makes a difference in the world. I can only imagine the difference this has made for those young children and girls. We all need a secure environment, even if it's only for three days. And Sandra actually popped that in, Paddy, before we heard, I agree, Colin, we, we, Abula Boss there, thank you, Sandra. She popped that into the comment chat box before we all heard about the magical experience of Priscilla. 
um, and she popped that in and now and you actually confirmed it with your story you know um, after that then Eamon popped in the link as um, as Colm said so we can we can access there on Facebook the Carol Girls Rescue Center and Kathy joining us over in America at um, just turning 7 a.m. and um, she said thank you so much for sharing your story and Gay is saying who's our, our guest on Monday thanks for being here Gay is saying uh, Paddy is an inspiration so um, I think that and I purposely waited often I um, Sarah Ward is saying incredible and she's got the heart emoji there as well and Eamon is saying Priscilla's story is one of the most beautiful and moving stories I have ever heard. Thank you Paddy and Gay is saying wonderful story. Thank you Paddy and Moshi. So I purposely waited to the end but I often say what I my comment or whatever um, at the start and then I go to the comments while I'm kind of finding them Paddy you know and I purposely left it to the end because I'm on the very edge of composure but your heart is something else. It's really, really lovely, beautiful heart. And thank you so much for coming on the Coffee at 11 show. And I'm going. <laughs> Thanks very much. Back to you, Colin. And this is me stepping in to rescue the princess. Not every day you get to rescue a princess. <laughs> uh, just beautiful, just beautiful. Uh, Paddy and Roisin, you've no idea how you've touched us. This, this is episode 60 of the Coffee at 11 show. So we've met 59 wonderful people so far. And, uh, you know, I, I don't think the, the entire cafe has been moved as much as it has been today. So hats off. My own dad has popped in. Uh, my dad, Tommy O'Brien, is a big fan of this man, Paddy O'Connor and Roisin, and the work they do. All right. Uh, listen, it's been a joy. It's been a joy. It's been a joy. Um, Gay Moore is in on Monday. Gay, thank you for uh, joining us, for agreeing to join us on the Coffee at 11 show. Really looking forward to that. And Gay uh, is a personal brand consultant. Hope I'm saying that right. Rise is the name of her business, and uh, she basically helps people uh, get noticed in a sea of noise out there. And uh, looking forward to hearing her journey because another incredible personal journey that has le led her to where she is with Rise. So, and I think perhaps Rise even uh, is is indicative of the story. So, really looking forward to that. So, folks, make time on Monday, pop back in and uh, join us for the Coffee at Eleven show. I want to thank Princess Shelley as ever. Tough one today, Princess. I want to thank the monk as ever. Tough one today. I'm watching it. Katrina O'Brien in advance, who was, didn't manage to make it today because uh, she works full time. Uh, but she's going to top and tail this and make it beautiful this evening. And I'm going to challenge her here and now to do it without crying. <laughs> That'll be interesting. And uh, it just uh, leaves me to say, Paddy O'Connor, namaste. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate it.